Okay, so next in our fundamental particle series, we have uh, muons and pions at their discovery. But before we can get into that, we've got to establish some background. Um, this is the first bit, which is uh, based on something that you've been doing recently uh, with Mr. Baker, which, uh, that um, charged particles uh, traveling at speed in a magnetic field are going to follow a circular path. And the reason they're going to follow a circular path is because the force created by the um, particle moving through the magnetic field is always at right angles to the direction of travel. And when you get a force at right angles to a direction of travel, you get circular motion. That was the definition of circular motion. So um, that's the first thing. Uh, if we have charged particles moving within a magnetic field, they're going to move in uh, circles. Um, you can see here that the uh, magnetic field is going into the page because it crosses. Um, so charged particles move in circles. Um, and the second one is that um, charged particles, as they are moving, because they are moving past uh, air atoms, uh, air molecules, and um, you know if they're moving through a solid, uh, through the uh, past the atoms that make up the solid, um, they're going to uh, be they're going to electrically interact with the electrons of those atoms that they're going past. Um, and the effect is that they ionize them. They rip away uh, some of the electrons of the uh, atoms that they're going past. Now, you can read this as well as I can. It takes something like 30 EV to remove an electron from a uh, gaseous atom, whereas something like an alpha particle may well have an energy of 3 million EV and therefore can ionize something like 100,000 atoms as it goes past them. Um, just the motion of that uh, high speed, high energy charged particle is going to tear electrons off um, everything that it goes past. And surprisingly, negative particles do this just as much as positive particles do it. Uh, they sort of punch the electrons out the other side rather than ripping them towards it, they push them away. But uh, any charged particle moving at speed through a medium is going to ionize the particles that it goes past. And um, that's what this is a graph of over here. Um, it's a uh, graph of the uh, energy lost um, as um, a uh, charged particle is traveling through a medium against the energy of the charged particle itself. And you can see that different charged particles um, have different uh, have different effects, have different amounts of energy lost to themselves as they pass through different materials. And the reason for that is that the ionization is proportional to the particle's mass and to the square of its charge. Um, and it also is very, very dependent upon the speed of the particle. Um, so slower particles spend more time going past the atom they're going past and therefore have more chance of uh, ionizing it, more chance of ripping off an electron as they go by. So we get this very different, we get these, uh, these gra this graph over here, the different behaviors for the same energy for different particles. And essentially that reflects their differences in their mass. Um, so for the same energy, a proton or a deuterium nucleus is going to be going um, a whole lot slower than a beta particle and therefore is going to do far more ionization um, as it uh, as it travels and an alpha particle of course um, because it's got even more charge it's going to do even more um, ionization uh, as it travels it's uh, it's energy loss uh, per uh, unit millimeter or whatever that uh, that graph there is going to be massive Now we use this ionization effect and the um, and the curving in a magnetic field to examine the uh, path of uh, charged particles and from their path try and work something out about the charged particles in uh, devices called cloud chambers. Um, this is uh, a schematic of a Wilson charge cloud chamber. And the way that a Wilson charge uh, cloud chamber works is that this uh, the this valve here is opened up to the vacuum chamber 
rapidly depressurizing this area up here as this piston goes downwards in response to the sudden open up of to the vacuum chamber, um, which means that the pressure in this drops suddenly, it cools and any water molecules that are in there, they want to condense because it's suddenly cooled down to a much lower temperature. So they want to condense out, um, but they can't easily condense without a nucleation center. Um, and nucleation centers um, uh, somewhere, uh, something that a droplet can form around. Um, the lack of nucleation centers in really uh, pure water is what allows you to take really pure water down to temperature lower than its freezing point uh, because there's nothing for the ice crystals to form around. Well, similarly here, we can super saturate the uh, rest of the air within that cloud chamber with water vapor uh, because we've suddenly dropped its temperature. Uh, the uh, water vapor in there wants to form clouds, um, but um, is unable to immediately form clouds because the interior of the chamber is really clean. There's a lack of nucleation in the centers. So there's no dust or anything for the uh, cloud to form upon. Unless, of course, we do as a uh, picture over here and we fire through a charged particle. Now, if we fire through a charged particle, then that charged particle is going to ionize uh, molecules as it goes past, and those ionized molecules form nucleation centers. So we get a little cloud forming where the charged particle has gone and you can see the track of our charged particle here. Now, one of the, and um, um, that charged particle you track, you can see there is curving, so it's in a magnetic field. Now, one of the problems that uh, the early theorists had when they were working on this is, how do you know whether or not it's a positive particle going that way, or it's a negative particle going that way? And so that's what this metal bar in the middle is, is for. Um, the charged particle as it goes through the metal bar is going to lose energy. And therefore, um, because the, uh, the particle is going to move, uh, lose energy, it's going to be going slower uh, when it comes out from the uh, having passed through the metal bar, which means it will be uh, moving in a tighter curve. Um, it'll be making a smaller circle. Um, and so we know that uh, this picture is actually a positive particle going this way because it's doing a tighter curve on this side, having lost energy in going through this bar. Clever, isn't it? Turns out this is the first ever picture of a positron, the first ever picture of the track left by a uh, positron. Um, and Anderson uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1936 uh, for the discovery of the positron. And he plays quite a large part in the rest of our story because he discovered the muon as well. So just to recap, cloud chamber, big magnetic field causes uh, charged particles within it to uh, follow curved tracks. Um, suddenly depressurizing the chamber um, means that the uh, water vapor within there wants to condense into a cloud. It'll do that around a nucleation center and the nucleation center is created by the ions that are formed by the passage of our charged particle. And there's from his uh, Nobel uh, lecture, there's Anderson's explanation of what's going on. Um, note he's comparing this to what a proton would do um, to make it clear to his audience that he hasn't just made a mistake in uh, saying that's a positron, that it has a quite different behavior uh, from that of a proton. Now, you might be aware that school has a uh, cloud chamber. You may have seen school, the cloud chamber at school working and it doesn't only work sometimes when we suddenly depressurize it. It works all the time, and that's because the one at school is a diffusion cloud chamber. Um, here we have uh, continually circulating isopropyl alcohol, and the isopropyl alcohol, as it circulates around and condenses, forms a supersaturated layer just here. Um, and that means that any charged particles that are going sort of sideways through this supersaturated layer. Um, will leave tracks behind. So we can't, with our diffusion cloud chamber, see the vertical tracks of um, charged particles coming in from outer space, um, but we can see a horizontal tracks if we put an alpha source in the middle or something like that, which is what we usually do when we're demonstrating the cloud chamber to you. The next advance beyond uh, cloud chambers were bubble chambers. Um, it seems like a bubble chamber might be a uh, sort of step backwards, but actually it gives you a cleaner picture. 
And so a bubble chamber is the same kind of thing, except this time it is a liquid which is suddenly depressurized. The liquid is on the verge of boiling by this sudden change in pressure by this piston here, suddenly dropping downwards, puts the, uh, the liquid on the verge of boiling, uh, but it can't form the bubbles necessarily to boil without the nucleation centers. And once again, our charged particles create the uh, nucleation centers. And if you take a photo just after you've dropped the piston, you can see the tracks of any charged particles that are going through at, at that time. And as I say, bubble chambers ended up giving cleaner pictures than cloud chambers. And so after the 1950s, um, lots of the uh, experiments, uh, experiment determination about what was going on with charged particles was done using bubble chambers rather than cloud chambers. Um, so for the, much of the rest of the course, when I show you an image of a particle track, it's almost certainly going to be a bubble chamber particle track the bu and the bubbles are forming in hydrogen. The other big advantage to that is because hydrogen is largely just protons, which means you've got a much cleaner behavior. You know what's in there. It's just going to be a set of protons. There's no neutrons in there or anything to muck things up. So you get a much cleaner behavior, a much more interpretable in behavior for what's going on with the bubble chamber than you do with a cloud chamber, which is a mixture of water and air and all sorts of things in a, in a cloud chamber. And so bubble chambers tend to uh, tended to be used after, as I say, the 1950s. Now, before um, bubble chambers came along and uh, sort of after cloud chambers, uh, we get the, uh, sorry, in the 1940s, we get the use of photographic emulsions. Now, this is the same thing as an old fashioned photograph, uh, old fashioned film, um, where uh, our photographic emulsion is a uh, suspension of silver halide particles for a particle, uh, for uh, use in particle physics, it's usually silver bromide. And silver halides don't require a lot of energy to turn back into silver and the halide. And they, uh, it's uh, only sort of quite tentatively being held together. And so if you expose it to light, you'll get it starting to turn back into silver. So the uh, reduction of the halide to silver, you know that uh, reduction means gain in electron. So the silver gains its electron back from the bromine uh, and goes back to being silver particles. Um, and so uh, we get little uh, little silver particles being created within the emulsion. And uh, if we add a uh, if we add a developer, then the developer um, enhances that reduction and makes those crystals grow larger so that we can actually see them. And so that's what you do with an old fashioned film. You develop it. You make those crystals enough to be able to see, but not so big that they swamp the whole picture and you can see what's gone on. Um, and the only reason I've put in the bit about Neville Mott here is that Mott is a bit of a hero in British physics terms. Um, he worked this out in 1938 when I was working on uh, superconductivity in the uh, very early 1990s. So was Neville Mott. He was 90 and he was still publishing papers about superconductors. Um, and lots of the stuff that I did on plasmas, the original papers that I went back to, they were by Neville Mott. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 1977, uh, uh, jointly with another chap called Anderson, but it's not the same Anderson as the Anderson we're talking about the rest of it. So Neville Mott, uh, one of the uh, experiment, uh, great British experimental physicists and theoretical physicists, lots of um, states of behaviour of electrons within um, solids are named after Mott. Um, and there you go, just a quick explanation of what that picture is. We've got a uh, proton and an antiproton uh, coming together and uh, colliding and annihilating one another and uh, creating a whole set of new particles that radiate outwards as a result. Now, just to end uh, this talk about uh, particle detectors, um, this one, um, I've uh, this slide here, just here, I've pinched slide I've pinched from a PowerPoint presentation um, from somebody at uh, the Large Hadron Collider from somebody at CERN um, explaining how different particle detectors work um, and uh, CERN essentially uses silicon diodes and we've been through how a diode works now and so you can imagine that uh, if enough energy is deposited into this depletion region in our diode we can uh, force electrons to jump out of the valence band and into the conduction band and we can detect that signal um, and so that's how a uh, silicon diode particle detector works 
Um, they, uh, there's a lot of discussion in that, that uh, this particular PowerPoint about how they would actually prefer to use diamond because diamond can stand up better to the uh, radiation, it doesn't de get degraded by the continually being hit by the radiation. Um, but the big advantage to silicon, I think it says here, is it because it's the most commonly used electronic uh, material, um, there's a highly developed industry for it. And he makes a comment about Atlas having 1.4 times 10 to the 8 pixels. Um, or 1.4 times 10 to the 8 silicon diodes used to be the particle detector, which of course sounds absolutely enormous until you remember that today, Atlas was first conceived and built a long time ago now by technology terms. Uh, today, I have a camera with 10 to the 7 pixels. Um, everybody's got cameras with 10 to the 6 pixels. Um, so uh, actually, these days, not all that impressive, which is one of the reasons why um, the Large Hadron Collider and its detectors, Atlas being one of the detectors, continue to get upgraded. Right, cosmic rays uh, are actually the main basis for this talk. Um, so um, cosmic rays um, are the sort of natural laboratory that early particle physicists used to work out what was going on. And uh, Hess uh, is credited with the early work on uh, cosmic rays. And so in 1936, he got the Nobel Prize along with Anderson. Anderson got the Nobel Prize for that picture of the positron, uh, but that picture of the positron came from the fact that there were cosmic rays. So Hess got it at the same time. And this is what Hess said in his uh, Nobel Prize lecture. Basically went up in a balloon with an electroscope. Um, and he discovered that uh, the electroscope loses charge um, more slowly as you move away from the surface of the Earth. You get away from all the uh, radiation also coming from the surface of the Earth, basically from the uranium in rocks. And then as you go higher and higher up, uh, the uh, rate at which it loses charge starts to climb back up again. And so he concluded that there must be penetration of the Earth's atmosphere from outer space by unknown radiation. Now he wanted to investigate this further. And so he took a balloon consent during a nearly complete solar eclipse. And thinking is, if these, uh, this unknown radiation is coming from the sun, then during a solar eclipse, the moon will block it all out and he won't see the same effect. And actually he saw exactly the same effect. So that the uh, conclusion is that these rays, this um, unknown radiation, it's known now, but unknown at the time radiation, uh, is not coming from the sun. So they are not solar rays. Um, they are cosmic rays. They are coming from the rest of the cosmos. Um, so this high energy radiation um, is not coming from the sun, coming from all of the rest of the universe around about us. OK, so a charged particle. Um, so imagine we get a charged particle uh, hitting the top of the atmosphere or uh, being created at the top of the atmosphere. It's going to lose energy as it travels due to, uh, due to the fact that it's ionising everything that goes past. Um, and this sentence here, we've already met this sentence, proportional to the particle's mass and uh, to the square of its charge. Um, this bit, not actually all that interesting because it turns out that all the particles uh, involved in uh, cosmic rays are unit charge. They've all got the same charge as an electron, either positive or negative, but they've all got the same charge as an electron. So this bit is not interesting. The ionisation is simply proportional to the particle's mass. This, however, is new. Isn't that a fantastic word? Bremsstrahlung. Um, Bremsstrahlung radiation. And it turns out that these high energy particles that form the cosmic rays that were discovered by Hess um, lose most of their energy as they travel, not via ionisation. Ionisation becomes a much more important process once they've uh, slowed down. Um, but when they're going really fast, the energy loss is via this. Um, and you can see where the German comes from there. Um, breaking radiation or deceleration radiation. Essentially, um, if an electron comes close to an atom, it's simply going to slow down because of the electric field of the atom. Um, that energy has got to go somewhere, so that energy be, uh, ends up being radiated out as gamma rays. And so really high energy particles lose most of their energy through this. They do not lose most of their energy through this, particularly when they're passing through the atmosphere, because you think if you're passing through the top of the atmosphere, you're not actually going to go past that many uh, atoms uh, because the pressure is low. 
Um, where, uh, but any atom you do go past, even if you don't ionize it, you're going to be uh, slowed down dramatically, which means you're going to be emitting Bremsstrahl long uh, radiation. Um, and again, the, the values here are quite different. We you remember this was sort of 30 EV when we were talking about it on the previous slide, um, whereas this could be uh, MEV. This could be millions of electron volts being radiated out in, uh, in gamma rays uh, as a result of that sudden slowing down, which is the other reason why um, this one is the one that's responsible for most of the energy loss of these high energy particles as they travel down through the atmosphere, not this one. Okay, so Anderson is using his Wilson clown chambers to investigate um, what's going on with these cosmic rays. What kind of particles are they? What's responsible for it? Um, I, might, I should just mention that Anderson is part of Millikan's group. Um, and Anderson realizes that he's got these particles that are behaving like electrons or uh, like positrons but are much more penetrating. They are making it down to the bottom of the um, atmosphere more often and are going through lumps of iron much more easily than we would expect from electrons. And then we've actually got two different groups within this, uh, within this cosmic ray radiation that he's investigating. Um, all of them have charged like electrons, some of them positive, some of them negative, um, but, some of them are going um, straight through, so through a piece of iron. Others are being stopped by a uh, piece of iron. So like he's got two different populations. Um, and he's struggling to explain it. At this same time, uh, the theory is uh, taking great leaps forward. And uh, these two guys, I'm not even going to try, try with that name, Bether and Heitler, something like that, um, worked out the maths for uh, what would be going on in terms of the amount of... Uh, Bramstrom radiation and the amount of uh, ionization going on as a charged particle travels. Um, and the curves that they come up with don't match the curves uh, that Anderson is seeing for his very penetrating radiation. It looks like his very penetrating radiation is uh, heavier than the electrons are um, because um, it's not doing as much Bremsstrahl long, as you would expect. And why is that? Well, a heavier particle, of course, isn't going to decelerate as much. F equals ma. The um, force being provided by the electric field of the atom as it goes past will be the same, um, but because the mass is higher, the deceleration will be lower, and so um, a heavier particle is less prone to Bremsstrahl long than a lighter particle, and so it looks like these are heavier particles. But we have no candidate for a heavier particle. And so everybody is confused. Um, so Anderson's saying to himself, well, does the theory fail? Is there a problem with this theory? Does it break down at uh, high energies? Um, why have we got these, uh, why have we got these uh, highly penetrating particles um, that uh, are both positive and negative uh, and have a unit charge like an electron? but they go through stuff much more than uh, their Bremsstrahl long theory should, says an electron should. Um, and Anderson and Nadermeyer themselves, when they were talking amongst themselves, talked about red and green electrons, talked about the two separate groups, the penetrating electrons and the not very penetrating electrons as two separate things, uh, red and green. Um, uh, and not quite being willing to admit that they found a new particle, um, but uh, clearly they've got something odd going on. Now, whilst they're doing all of their measurements, um, other people are trying other things. And uh, Curry Street, I love that name, brilliant, isn't it? He didn't use the name Yavez, he used the name Curry, so Curry Street, and his co-workers uh, take this picture. Um, and so we have um, this picture here of a curving track. Now, you can see I hope that it's a dense track and because it's a dense track that means it's something that's moving slowly um, because it's doing a lot of ionization and um, it's not one of that it's not a thin track like the one of the uh, positron that we looked on earlier looked at it earlier on and when curry does the measurements on this 
he realizes that they've got something that comes out of a an intermediate mass somewhere between the mass of the electron and the uh, mass of the proton he's worked it out to be 130 electron masses um, the actual value today is 207 electron masses but uh, this is the first ever picture that everybody accepts is a intermediate particle and so Anderson found lots of evidence for intermediate particles from their behavior um, curry a street here takes a picture of um, the track of uh, one of these particles and everybody comes to grow together and agrees that we must have a new particle we must have an intermediate mass particle both positive and negative that we didn't have before and um, that's making a portion of this radiation that uh, we call cosmic rays um, and um, Anderson calls it the mesotron uh, other people call it the Yukon uh, Yukon um, because, of course, people are thinking it's Yukawa's particle. You remember a couple of lectures ago, I said that Yukawa had predicted the existence of an intermediate mass particle somewhere around about 200 times the mass of the electron that was going to be the exchange particle for the um, strong nuclear force. And so um, just before the Second World War, uh, most people thought, well, we've probably found Yukawa's particle. And so they started to give it a name that reflected the fact that they perhaps found Yukawa's particle. However, there was a problem. And this experiment here uh, is amazing mostly for the fact that it's being done in Rome um, at the same time that the Allies are marching in on Rome, um, trying to displace the Germans. Um, Italian physicists are keeping their heads down and trying to get on with serious particle physics and make amazing discoveries, um, whilst uh, the two armies, the Allies and the Nazis, are fighting each other. Just amazing. Um, now, what, uh, what these guys started to do was they started to use uh, magnets to um, uh, act as lenses to um, concentrate the charged particles um, into their uh, experiment. And so that's what this portion here is. Um, they, are, um, they are magnets that are designed to curve um, either the positive or the negative particles uh, into their experimental array and curve the um, opposite charge one away. So you can see here the track of a charged particle that's been drawn in. The track of a charged particle comes down here, curving into, the, uh, into their array of uh, detectors um, through the magnets. And then uh, what they're aiming to do is they're aiming to have their muons um, decay within the absorber. And then they are going to follow the track or detect the particle that comes out the other side as a result of that uh, that uh, that decay of our muon and the particle that comes out the other side is either an electron or a positron okay but because of their setup it means that they can either uh, have their magnets set up so that they focus in the negative muons or they can have it set up so that they focus in the positive muons and they deflect away the others so it allows them to separate the, out the behaviors of the two of them Now, why would you want to do that? Well, because um, it was pointed out that the Coulomb field of the nucleus means the capture probability for negative mesons is much greater than their decay probability. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that um, the negative mesons are going to get attracted towards the nucleus of atoms. And because we think these are Yukawa's particles, we are expecting these to want to interact very strongly with the nucleus. So if they get attracted in towards the nucleus, they're then going to absolutely interact with the nucleus. And so we are going to see a very strong um, interaction here. And so they're going to interact with the nucleus. They're going to blow the nucleus apart, essentially. They're not going to do decay and spit out a, uh, an electron that can then be detected by, the, uh, the, by this array C of uh, GM tubes. Um, whereas positive mesons, that won't be true. Positive mesons, they're going to be repelled away from the nucleus. They're not going to get an opportunity to interact with the nucleus because uh, the Coulomb charge is going to repel them away. Um, and so they're going to have to decay 
inside the absorber rather than uh, be uh, that rather than hit the nucleus and interact with the nucleus and so for positive mesons we should expect to see positrons come out the other side of the absorber so that's what this says um, for negative muons we don't expect to see um, electrons come out of the absorber for our positive mesons we do expect to see uh, positrons come out the other side of our absorber So that's true. Practically all the decay processes which one observes should be due to positive mesons or uh, positive muons. Now, when they try this, they start off with an ion absorber. And when they try it with an ion absorber, they get just that. They, um, they don't get lots of electrons coming out of the other side when they've got it set up to uh, work with uh, their negative muons. Um, and so they assume that those negative muons must be um, being absorbed by the nucleus and not doing normal decay. However, when they put a carbon absorber in, the reason they switched over to a carbon absorber actually is not clear. No one quite knows why they, why they tried uh, carbon instead. Um, something to do with um, a different carbon having a different behaviour in terms of gamma rays. But anyway, they, they tried using a carbon absorber instead. Now, if this prediction by Tom Managa and Araki is correct, it shouldn't make the slightest bit of difference whether it's carbon or iron. But when they put in a carbon absorber, suddenly they find that the... Um, they're seeing pretty much the same number of uh, decay products, pretty much the same number of electrons coming out here as they see positrons coming out. The negative mesons and negative muons are not ending up being absorbed by the nucleus. And that's extraordinary because they're supposed to be Yukawa's particles. And if they're Yukawa's particles, they should want to get involved with the nucleus. Um, and yet, all right, when we had iron in there, they were quite happy to get involved with the nucleus. But as soon as we put carbon in there, they don't seem to want to be bothered by the nucleus. That's not right. That's that's not what theory predicts. They're your car with particles. The whole point of your car with particles is to stick the nucleus together. They should get involved with the nucleus, um, but they're not getting involved with the nucleus when carbon's in there. This is madness. This is you know really inconsistent. Um, and I find it quite amazing that particle physicists actually took this seriously. I mean, this is an experiment that's being done in Rome whilst the Allies are coming in to kick the uh, Germans out. Um, you know, it's obviously being in a, done on a shoestring. These guys are uh, having to hide what they're doing from the Germans. Um, and yet particle physicists around the world did take this experiment seriously. It's probably because Fermi was told about it and Fermi took it seriously and everybody uh, took Fermi's word for it. Um, but this one experiment basically put a kibosh on the idea that um, these particles that have been found by Anderson and photographed by Street um, were actually Yukawa's particles. Yukawa himself wrote a paper suggesting that maybe um, there were two different intermediate weight particles. Maybe this muon that had been discovered by Anderson wasn't actually his intermediate weight particle. And at the time Yukawa wrote that and other people were talking about it, um, what they didn't realise was that this had actually already been demonstrated. And it had been demonstrated by a group who were working in Bristol. Occhialini um, was an Italian who was working in Bristol with uh, the uh, professor in charge called Powell. Um, and what they came up with was they came up with very sensitive um, photographic emulsions um, to be able to detect particle tracks once they've been developed. And then they flew them um, in RAF bombers. You know, this is still, you know, the Second World War is only just ending. It's still, the war is still on in Japan. Um, they flew them in RAF bombers at really high altitudes um, to expose them to the cosmic rays. And then they brought them back and they traced, um, you know, this is probably only a couple of millimetres long. They traced particle tracks and you can see had to assemble different bits of photograph together in order as they trace the particles as they traveled through their stack of um, photographic plates, photographic emulsion to put together particle tracks. Um, and uh, I imagine you can read for yourself what uh, Occhialini uh, said about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've only been involved in science in a really small way, but uh, 
when I was doing stuff that I thought was new, that I thought nobody else had ever thought of before, the, it's hard to describe the excitement. Um, Occhialini Ocul there gives some impression of the excitement when when they realised that they were doing something new and they exposed these um, these images, when they developed these images and they realised that they actually had something new going on. Um, it must have been incredibly exciting for uh, everybody involved. And, you know, they're running around like nutters getting excited when, uh, you know, the natives of Bristol were uh, looking at them like they were crazy because they, they, you know, they just lived through a wall. Um, they weren't going to get excited about little tiny tracks in uh, photographic plates. Anyway, uh, what are we looking at here? Well, you can perhaps see that this track at the end here uh, is very light. It's got a low ionization density. Uh, it's not transferring a lot of energy, which tells us that it's a low mass particle. So that's our electron. Um, and this is our muon. See the little symbol there, mu. This is our muon. But something else is decaying first to create the muon. And Powell and his group refer to it as the pion. Um, and we can also see that something now that there are other particles being created because conservation of momentum doesn't allow a particle to go through 90 degrees um, like that. It can't be done. Conservation of momentum just does not allow it. And so we know that something else has come out there. And we know that the something else that has come out there is not interacting with our photographic uh, emulsion. It must be a weakly interacting neutral particle. Well, we have a candidate for a weakly interacting neutral particle, don't we? We have a new, it must be a neutrino. So we've got one intermediate weight particle decaying into another intermediate weight particle via neutrinos, then decaying into an electron. And once again, there must be neutrinos being fired out. Actually, in this case, we know now there are two neutrinos being fired out. Amazing. It's right at the end of the Second World War in Bristol. Flown in back of RAF bombers. These pictures um, are the first pictures of the particle tracks left behind by a whole new particle, the pion, and shows that pion decaying into Anderson's particle, the muon, and decaying again into an electron and all the time firing out neutrinos. Absolutely astonishing. Okay, just to sum up, uh, let's quickly mention uh, what cosmic rays, we now understand cosmic rays to be. Um, cosmic rays are now actually thought to be protons. So this is a proton. Um, they protons, of course, being hydrogen nuclei, some process out in the uh, out in the space, probably around a black hole, uh, that accelerated the proton up to absolutely crazy energies. And you see that says 10 to the 15 electron volts. Um, can't remember, what's that, Yocta? Um, amazing, amazing energies. Um, they then strike something at the top of our atmosphere. You can see 35 kilometers up, top of our atmosphere. They strike something, um, and in the process, um, they create a set of pions. Um, some of those pions quickly decay into muons. Um, and those muons then penetrate down. They don't do as much Bremsstrahl long radiation. Um, and so they penetrate right down to the uh, surface of the Earth. Um, the neutral pions decay into really high energy gamma rays, which then do pair production. We're going to do pair production later on in the course. Um, and then those really high energy electrons themselves um, do more Bremsstrahl long radiation. Um, uh, those high energy electrons, because we remember an electron does do a lot of Bremsstrahl long radiation. So those high energy electrons or positrons, they do Bremsstrahl long radiation. That Bremsstrahl long radiation uh, creates more photons and those photons create more pairs. And so we get this cascade of photons and electrons and positrons uh, being created uh, largely from the pi zeros um, because the charged pi's tend to create these muons, which do a whole lot less Bramstrahl long radiation, and so make it through 
to the surface of the Earth where we can detect them, whereas the Pi Zero does this cascade of Bremsstrahl long electrons, positrons, Bremsstrahl long electrons, positrons, um, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth until the uh, photons that are being created are too low energy um, to create, do any more pair production, and those photons make it through to the surface of the Earth. Now, that word, this is obviously on a Dutch website, I had to look it up, means particles. So what have we got? 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 particles, 80% um, of which are photons arriving at the surface of the Earth, 80% of photons, 18% are electrons and positrons, and the other, most of the other 2% are our muons that were created right at the top of the atmosphere um, and made it right down to the surface. Okay, so summary. Cloud chambers, bulb chambers, and photographic emulsion were all used to record the ionizing passage of charged particles. Magnetic fields curve those paths. We deliberately use magnetic fields to curve the paths of the charged particles to allow us to be able to tell what kind of particle we're looking at. Today, the same thing is done, but using solid state detectors, a bit like the uh, array of detectors in your on the digital camera. Cosmic rays bombard the top of the atmosphere with energies much, much higher than seen in nuclear decay and these create power showers of particles. Within those showers of particles, we have muons, which are intermediate mass particles, somewhere between the electron and the proton, um, which penetrate to the ground in large numbers. We also have pions, which are also intermediate mass particles, um, but they do not make it down to the surface because they quickly decay into muons or they get absorbed on the nucleus. And as you'll see in the next lesson, the pions are indeed Yakawa's predicted strong nuclear force exchange particles. The muons are not, but the pions are. Um, so we have two intermediate uh, mass uh, particles somewhere between the electron and the proton, um, neither of which were obviously necessary for the uh, chemistry, you know, the, the production of the world as we know it, but both were discovered by examining um, cosmic rays. Okay.